Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Although Francis Fox Piven is a distinguished professor of political science and sociology at the CUNY Graduate Center, her work and influence have extended far beyond the university. She's long been a hero of mine because of her determination to bring economic and social justice to this democracy we call ours. But what's happening to our democracy? What is going on? Well, terrible things have been going on for 40 years, I think. And just in the last couple of weeks, I, there are signs that maybe it's turning around. Yeah. And maybe, maybe people are rising up here as they did in Tahir Square. That was really something, yeah. wasn't it, to watch? It is. And uh, the Wisconsin uh, ex display is, is also encouraging, isn't it? Oh, it is so encouraging. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you think about how it unfolded. It began with high school students. Yeah. Uh, marching to the state capitol, and then the college students, and then the unions came okay. too. It's amazing. Uh, but it's a dream of yours. It's the way people should be doing things, right? It's the way, yes, because <laughs> when people turn out on the streets and when they come out in large numbers, and when they're both angry and hopeful, uh, sometimes they have an imprint. They make an impact on our democracy. You know, uh, David Brooks began his column in today's New York Times saying, well, uh, you know, Scott Walker was elected, democratically elected, and those Republicans were democratically elected. What's the trouble here? Nothing. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of trouble in our democracy. Uh, the troubles created by big money by propaganda and the troubles created by the machinations of Republican office holders who first spend down all our revenues yeah. and then say no choice but to cut the programs that feed the poor or take care of the aged. And that was what was happening. That's exactly right. I mean, do we forget that they were the Republican presidents who handled and handed us these deficits. It's really unbelievable to me. But you said 40 years. What was 40 years ago? What was the start? Well, maybe 50 years. I think the start was probably Jimmy Carter, but certainly Ronald Reagan. You know, we had a kind of renaissance in American politics in the 1960s. I think of it as a renaissance right. because it was a period when people who are or ordinarily ignored were heard, uh, had an impact, and when a Democratic Party in power was forced to respond to people they ordinarily ignored, just as the other party ignores them. Uh, but as the movement subsided in the 1970s, other forces, the big business interests mainly, and right-wing uh, Republicans uh, began to reconnoiter to figure out how now was the time that they could retake what the people had claimed. And they did. They, they did it. They did it. Actually, they began planning it in the Nixon administration. We have actually records of uh, Nixon and his advisors, Haldeman and Ehrlichman, uh, sitting around and talking about how to pry the white working class away from their allegiance to the Democratic Party. That was what they wanted to do because they wanted to win re uh, elections on the Republican ticket. But how did they pry the white working class away from their allegiance to the Democratic Party? It was by working to replace the basic New Deal economic agenda, which was how the Democrats had cemented the working class uh, to, the, to, to themselves, to their column, replaced that agenda with a whole array of cultural issues, but mostly race, mm -hmm. mostly race. And it, it, it has... It's a great divide, isn't it? The great, great divide, divide, once you could uh, persuade large numbers of white working class people that their problems had to do with race and sex, uh, <laughs> we were in a lot of trouble. Do you, what is it that motivates the, there's a difference, I guess, between 
active Republicans and active Democrats, right? What is the, what's the basic difference? I mean, the Republicans, what? They believe in small government and in the... They don't believe in small government. They're lying. They're yeah. lying. Well, what is it, the they difference? They believe in a... They believe... Privileged class? They believe in... The uh, Horatio what, Alger what, what Pierre Bourdieu do, do call the right hand of government. They believe in those functions of government that have to do with security, with the military, with aggression. Uh, they and police and National Guard and the CIA. That's the kind of government they want. Uh, and uh, they want that kind of government also to guard company uh, factories and uh, he here and abroad. They want an American military presence domestically and internationally. Uh, but the kind of, the parts of government that ease life for ordinary people and by, by uh, providing assistance to people when they become disabled or when they get sick or when they get old or to orphans or those parts of government they have no interest in. The parts of government that provide some security for working people through unemployment insurance, they're not interested in that. Uh, the, and and the, so what they do is just listen to the discussion about the deficit. Mm -hmm. When have you heard a major Republican leader say, let's put defense spending on the cutting board? Never, never, never. That's off the table. What's on the table is what they call uh, discretionary spending, and those are social service programs, basically. Uh, so th it's not they don't want government, though. They want a very aggressive government uh, but, that does what they want it to do. And allows the rich to get richer, I guess. Yes. Isn't it? Basically Look at the that? prisons in the United States. Yeah. Have they proposed cutting no. spending for prisons? No. No. And those prisons, the rise of prisons is, you know, roughly correlated with the rise of inequality. But also is the, their lack of interest in increasing revenues. <laughs> well, they that, did, the they did go along with an increase, with a, uh, they did go along with an increase in the Social Security tax yeah. uh, some 30 years ago. Right. Uh, but basically they don't want to increase uh, the the income tax or business taxes, and in fact, we have in the last those forty years, we've seen a rollback in the taxes paid by affluent people and by uh, corporations in the United States. A big rollback. If you say, well, I mean, look at this is, you know, the it's a joke it's a bad joke they create the deficits and then they say because of the deficits we have to, we have to cut social services yeah. we have to roll back public worker pensions but you know when george w bush won the election he inherited a federal budget that was in surplus right exactly and what did he do he made two wars uh, greatly increased military spending, put, pushed through a series of tax cuts for the very rich, and pushed through Medicare Part D, which it's true gave a kind of distorted prescription coverage to seniors, but at the price of huge subsidies so for the good. health insurance companies. And then, eight years of this, <laughs> there's a deficit. It's incredible. It's, you know, I mean, how can a Congress produce legislation like the Part D of, the social, of, of Medicare? It is the most ludicrous, the donut. How can sensible people really, what's happened to us as far as electing sensible people? Do we do it? And this all goes back to what you're saying is that people have to be organized. They have to exert their power, right? Right. You well, mean? the politicians are sensible about their own careers. That's what they're sensible yeah. about. Has it always been that way historically? Yeah. 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 Politicians are made, uh, they're made honest and they're made visionary. But when masses of people mobilize, that's when we get great presidents. Yeah. They're not. 
I bread in the womb. I had always grown up, and I thought, you know, I grew up during Roosevelt, and I always thought that you ran for public office because you stood for something and you wanted to do something about it. I, I guess I you was thought very that? naive. I did. Yeah. Well, maybe you ran for public office because you wanted <laughs> to do something. Oh, well, that. I definitely did that by the time I did it, but uh, it's, it has. It's a career now, and I didn't think it was always such a career ladder, but I guess when you look back historically, it was. Yeah, everybody started, they started local or they did something yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. Um, you Except know, FDR, he started from an uh, aristocratic family, actually. Right, he had the money. Yeah. Um, you're, you're under, I, didn't, I don't want to spend too much time with this, but you're under severe attack and danger and threats and everything else because of a paper you wrote with your late husband in 1966 about poverty. And that was the guaranteed minimum income, right? Uh, it, and, and we don't have to go through this whole thing, but Beck, what's his first name? Glenn. Glenn Beck has picked on that and accused you of all kinds of things, and you've become a target for all these right-wing Tea Party, basically, is it that? Uh, but it, it was a question about poverty. So where do we stand today with poverty? Well, we made some progress in reducing poverty uh, in this country. Uh, in the late 1960s, the 1970s, uh, the level of poverty in the United States fell. And that, that was an accomplishment. I think it fell largely because of the movements of the era. Um, the civil rights movement and its northern wing was really an economic rights mm -hmm. movement as well as a right. civil rights movement. And the movement that I was involved with, the Na uh, National Welfare Rights Movement, was also it was sort of a part of this great black movement for full political and economic rights. And the women with whom I worked, the, these were very poor women. Most of them were from the South. Uh, they were part of the huge upheaval that had been created by the mechanization of southern agriculture. These people mm -hmm. were forced off the land mm -hmm. and they migrated to the cities. Being human animals, they had babies. Uh, and these women were uh, very, very poor. And we did some research, Richard, my partner, and I, and we determined that they were eligible, a lot of them were eligible for welfare, a program created in the 1930s, but they were not getting it from the city agencies. What the city, New York City, uh, liberal New York City, the Department of Welfare was giving these families bus tickets back to South Carolina rather than letting them on welfare, letting them get some welfare this or some Medicaid. This is in the 60s, huh? Late, uh, yeah, by 1966 there was Medicaid. Uh, so a movement emerged, and the movement, to some extent, I mean, it was informed by a paper which showed that there was this great reservoir of eligibility, but it was basically a movement that was part of the larger movement, the movement of American blacks for Equity full civil equal, rights right. and, uh, and some economic yeah. rights as well. Uh, the I'm very proud of the work we did, and I'm very proud of the welfare rights movement. I still see those women. You know, when I went to, I went to the uh, uh, U.S. Social Forum in Detroit last summer, and incredibly, <laughs> one of the leaders of the U.S. Social Forum, who I met again after so many years, was Marion Kramer, uh -huh. who was a welfare rights leader in Detroit. Oh, that's so great. Uh, in the early 1970s. That's so great. Yeah. So now, but tell us, I, I mean, there are poor people now. Oh, so and poverty, how are we responding? poverty was reduced, right. and gradually it's been edging up. It's part of a big change in the pattern of income distribution in the United States. The top 1% has been making out like bandits they are getting a larger and larger share right. of the income distribution, uh, about three times the share that they had 30 years ago, 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, the top 10% is doing well. The top 20% is doing a little less well. The middle is lagging behind. 
and people in the lower quintiles of the income distribution are doing very badly. And they've been forgotten. And the right, people who, there are a million people in New York City that are living on incomes of less than $10,000 for a family. In New York City, this is the city that's the richest of the rich. The city glitters, and everybody in the world can see its glitterings. Huge uh, condos going up, all glass, selling for four and five million dollars for Incredible. penthouses, fireplaces, and those palaces are going up in neighborhoods that used to be lived in by working and poor New Yorkers. When I grew up in New York, I grew up in Jackson Heights, but I would come to Manhattan. I knew all those neighborhoods like Hell's Kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, those were neighborhoods of working, working and people. poor New Yorkers, and the rich have pull, pushed them out. Yeah, it's been horrible. I mean, it is horrible, but they changed the welfare rules and, and laws with the temporary assistance with the needy families, TANF. That was so-called Clinton's welfare reform. Well, it was actually a Republican, Republican. bill uh -huh. that Clinton decided to uh -huh. sign. Uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> obviously, he should have vetoed it. It yeah. was a terrible bill. It's, it's called the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families uh, program. It replaced aid to families with dependent children. Basically, what it did was it took the money that we were spending on aid to these families and it converted that money into block grants to the states. The states get that amount of money, whether or not they give the assistance to the poor families. So they're and able to... Then the legislation gave the states the authority, and in some instances it even required them to introduce new and punitive rules that restricted aid to families. And there are lifetime restrictions now, isn't it? Yes, that? yes. And also, now we're cutting childcare. Now that we've we have this crisis in the budgets and all the state the government levels, I mean, what are the first things to go are going to be the the human uh, expenses. But it makes no sense. The childcare is being cut when that was one of the essentials of the whole program, wasn't it? If you're going well, to put we never people did to enough. work, we never did enough with childcare. It never became a major issue. Why was that? It's just because it was women and children. Well. You know, it was key, wasn't it? It was absolutely key. Uh, the, the, the slogan of the re so-called reform, which took away a centuries-old program, really, mm. the slogan of that program was work, workfare, not welfare. Mm -hmm. How and do you work if you have children? How, how do you work? The child care arrangements were very slipshod. Uh, Mostly, the child care that was available was provided by other welfare recipients who, as their work assignment, took in the children of the welfare recipients who were now cleaning the streets. Uh, the, mm. Now, I happen to think that poor children, more than any other children, need the best child care. By Back the to most the old days of Head Start. Yeah, by the most qualified yeah. people, uh, and they're not getting it. We, they're not getting it now. Political science. Let's just cover that before we end this thing. Do we have hope for the future? What's going to happen? Well, you know, I, I, I may be a political scientist. I never did know a political scientist who I would even ask the question <laughs> of. The, uh, but you know, I have hope for the future right now, and I've been especially hopeful in recent weeks. Uh, it's the rise of protest movements across Europe. You know, our, we're so transfixed by the excitement of what's happening in the Middle East and especially Egypt yeah. uh, that we haven't noticed that across Europe uh, there are anti-austerity protests and they're big and students are very, very important in those protests. Great Britain had, yeah. Yes, UK uncut in Great Britain. No wonder students are at the center of these protests in the vanguard, because they understand. They're, they are new, they have very high levels of unemployment. 
the programs that are being cut are the programs that will make their lives uh, more decent. But, you know, we watched this happen in Ireland, in Italy. I saw a wonderful protest in Spain. It took the form of rumba dancing <laughs> in a big bank. <laughs> and uh, we watched it happen elsewhere, but now I think maybe it's going to happen in the United States as well because of those great people in Wisconsin, led by the students, high school students yes. and University of Wisconsin students. And then the unions came out. And we've had huge, biggest demonstrations in the history of Wisconsin. And I think that the, as the right-wing campaign, not only to cut public sector workers, to destroy public sector unions, but to cut the public sector, as this campaign proceeds across the states, I think the movement is going to proceed as well. And I'm hopeful that the movement will stop the campaign, stop it in its tracks, and reverse the mad policies of the last 40 years. Well, now, don't you think also they've gotten a little madder in the last two years? I mean, they've been pretty bad. But with Obama's election, haven't the Republicans in the Congress oh, yeah. reacted? Oh, yeah. Now, is that, do you think, that's a combination of all kinds of things, but race is also part of it? Well, I think that the business community, especially the sort of right-wing dragons in the business community, like the Koch brothers or Richard right. Mellon Scaife from the old days, the business community, I think, wants to make sure that Obama you know, that he wobbles and that he compromises. And, and so they're bellowing and bellowing and bellowing. The, but, you know, the, the right in the United States has two wings. One wing is business. Major corporations making so much money abroad, they don't think they should have to tolerate taxes that make it possible for Americans to have bridges that don't fall down, for example, uh, to have social services. And if they do have to have bridges that don't fall down, they want working people to pay for them, not them. Not <laughs> them. Uh, that's, so that's one wing of the right. The other wing of the right is increasingly a kind of movement wing. It has, it's gone through phases in the last 40 or 50 years, the Christian right, the militias, the patriots, yeah. and now it's the Tea Party. Uh, the, they all draw on uh, elements of American culture, authentic elements of American culture, and, but mostly they draw on fear of the changes that are taking over the country, and they draw on American racism. You know, never mm -hmm. forget the unthinkable happened. Mm -hmm. We elected an African-American president. And a lot of people look around them, especially if they live in Arizona, and they see that the population is turning brown. And that life is getting very, very upsets. Different. That really upsets them. Yeah. It makes me feel great. Right. But it, uh, it's very upsetting to other people. Do you th don't you think that they're getting so extreme that um, it's going to have to change? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Right. I think some of their uh, leaders and spokespeople are getting a little lunatic. Yeah. I think yeah. they really, yeah. yeah. Especially with Glenn Beck, who we have, have all decided. What do you read? What kind of papers, magazines, periodicals do you read? What do I read? Well, I'm always reading my email and all the <laughs> listservs that I get. But I read uh, New Left Review. I read Dissent. I read the American Political Science Review. I read New Perspectives on Politics. I read the American Sociological Review. I read Contemporary Sociology. Uh, I read uh, the New International. 
I read. Uh, I'm, the Nation, you better. I say. read The Nation, of yeah, course. You better say that. Of course, I read The Nation. <laughs> it feels like I write The Nation. <laughs> do you read the newspapers? Yes, I do. It's an old it's habit. It's too bad, right? It's yeah. an old habit. I can. Yeah, it is. It's it, that's hurting us, though, is it? Is the net? Is the internet taking over? The, is internet, the internet commuting came is, to more people. The internet is taking over, and I still, I don't think we yet have a good picture of what that means. Some people, I think this is partial and maybe a little romantic, think that the internet is democratically empowering. Uh, it, for one thing, it's used by social movements. They can mm -hmm. communicate with each other so rapidly. But I think, th and then there is uh, the social networking through Twitter mm -hmm. and Facebook which I don't do. Neither do uh, I. I can't remember that. Uh, but I think that the internet is also proving to be a vehicle for the right. Yeah. Uh, I found, for example, that when uh, I troll through the blogs, that I think a lot of angry, activated right-wingers are getting on all the liberal blogs. Right. It's very confusing. Yeah. Well, we've come to the end of our program, but we are optimistic about the future. I'm always optimistic and pessimistic, too, but <laughs> I'm, you don't have I, any choice. Yeah, and people who really are believe in, in, in uh, insight, sometimes movements, you have to be optimistic, right? Because yeah. you do believe you can make a difference. Yes. Thank you so much, Francis. It was always lovely a pleasure. to have you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.